Hello and welcome to The Nod, a mindful motorcycle podcast. I'm Ben Bowers and once again I'm joined by Anthony Partridge and Charlie Borman. Hello chaps. Hello, hello. How are you? Very well. Yeah, good. not bad actually. We went to a nice party last night. We had a lovely yeah, time last night. We went night. to yeah, the good. November Awards and you were up for an award and you didn't get it. Didn't get it. Well, but, that, was, uh, that was quick. Did you Quick to get that in. Thank you. Do you think he thought he was going to get it? I think he thought he was going to get it. I, I saw him have, he tucked a little piece of paper in his back pocket. Oh, yeah, had a speech. It was going to be a session. Thing. Yeah, I think oh. there were at least four pages, so thank God he didn't get it. Oh, <laughs> Ben. Sorry, mate. It's all right, I'm over it. Okay. okay. I drank my way through the disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit dusty today. No, um, no, it was a, it was a, it was great accolade to be even, even I was, it was very nice to be nominated. So, uh, and really. it was lovely to see everybody from November. What is it? 1.4 billion, million, 100 million or something? 1.4 billion dollars raised. 1.4 billion dollars raised. Yeah. So, um, you know, both of you and I have both had testicular cancer and lost our nuts. We have. And, well, yeah, there's not many nut. testicles in the room today. No, there's definitely, yeah. Uh, I mean, how there's many? There's only five. That's true. Five. Four men, five nuts. <laughs> that could so be a good podcast. You weren't expecting that, were you, I wasn't yeah. expecting that, no. <laughs> <laughs> Moving no, well, on. Well, both of us directly because of the fundraising from November, we both um, survived cancer. Yeah. On that good note, times. maybe we should uh, finish the intro. Anyway, let's, let's finish it. We can cut yeah, that out. Yeah. Notice everybody cut that bit out. <laughs> uh, once again, we'll be diving into the archives of our own adventures on two wheels and experiences catching up on the recent goings on in the bike world some news just out on that front we'll have a little chat about maybe um, relevant to our guest as well uh, and uh, yeah welcoming as I said another guest to the den of egos which is the line I think we're going to keep in um, as, as will become apparent soon <laughs> maybe change um, the name from the nod to the den of egos, the den of egos. <laughs> uh, as we venture through the rich world of bike culture and subculture we'll delve into themes of well-being and mental health and empower conversations around those subjects as I say we have a new guest today a big welcome to the most successful rider in British superbike history, Shane Shaky Burn. Thank you for having me. Well, Shane or Shaky? Welcome. Janet, if you want, whatever. Janet. I'm easy today, Janet, no problem. Janet, okay. <laughs> we'll go with Shaky. <laughs> you've, 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 you've never been that easy before, Shaky. <laughs> <laughs> why, why, why Shaky? Do you know what? It's such a it's such a boring story. You never know how life's going to go, right? And if I had, if I had knew life was going to go the way it, it, it kind of went, then maybe I would have made up a cooler story. But the reality of it was I was in a swimming pool in Spain and I got out and it was windy and I started shaking and one of my friends I was there with was like, look at Shaky Shane and unfortunately it stuck. So it's <laughs> a really, really rubbish, <laughs> rubbish reason for having a nickname. <laughs> but that is, that's what, exactly why you have mates is because yeah. they nail it on yeah, yeah. every time, don't they? And observational nicknames are always yeah. the best. Perfect. aren't they yeah. I spent years being introduced as Benny No Nuts yeah. which is a bit more disarming for people you get a bit more blank looks go what <laughs> <laughs> who knew uh, that a kid from a council estate riding around on his BMX making motorbike noises would eventually end up here in the Nod studio Pretty sure you didn't. Looking back, I, I definitely didn't. I mean, <laughs> I think there was a lot in between that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, winning your first podium, have I, have yeah, a, bit. a few, yeah. few bits and pieces happened in between the two the two events, Finally, like me from... getting lost on the district line and then ended up in the street down the road there somewhere. But uh, yeah, no, we're here now. So highlights, highlights. It's all, it's all good. Uh, Shaky, you are the only rider to win six British Superbike titles. You've also been a double race winner in the Superbike World Championships as a wild card. Yep. I have. Good, nodding, good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you competed for two seasons in the Premier Class at MotoGP. Well, really, it was like a season and a half because, hey. yeah. Well, but anyway, we'll yeah, we that. was there. We were there. Yeah. Uh, you made your debut in BSB in 1999. That's correct. Probably makes you feel about as old as the rest of us. <laughs> Uh, and he went on to race for a further 19 years, which is 19 years more than I've raced, to be fair, uh, until a massive crash at Snetterton ended your season and potentially your career. It did, yes. There's always a chance. Let's not write it off. Exactly. <laughs> Let's um, keep it open. <laughs> uh, at the time, you were the oldest rider in British Superbikes at 42. Shut up. Michael Rutt is about 850. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Was that, is that, is that not a fact? Yeah. Yeah. Was he riding in British Superbikes that year? I don't know. He might have done a few wild cards or something, didn't he? Yeah, he, he is old, Rutter, yeah. isn't he? Yeah, he's I, like to, I like to let him know all about it as well. We were teammates back in 2002 and we get on really, really well. So, uh, yeah, and I'm sure he was on the grid. You're, you're off to, to drive a, uh, a car around the track soon, aren't you? Um, 
I did. Just you well, did. not around the track. I, I, uh, I did it. Um, I drove uh, an aerial atom. An aerial recently. atom. But 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 what's interesting if you if you drive a car around the racetrack, um, uh, and then a motorbike, the the some corners the 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 entry and the exit is is the same, mm. and then but then a lot of the corners, um, they're completely different, aren't they? So yeah. I don't know. That must have felt. Uh, did it feel strange, or have you? Race cars around tracks. You probably have. I've, I've had a I've had a couple of goes in cars around tracks, and it's something that that I'd really like to to try to do a little bit more. Yeah. Um, but I think at the moment that you know we touched on on 2018. I think if I can't jump back on a motorbike and and race a motorbike around a track, which is something I am half sensible at, then you know what am I going to bring to the table in a in a car racing team that that somebody's been racing cars as long as me or whatever you know and has that experience what am I going to bring to the table that's going to be any different apart from a bit of a, a screw loose because they all think motorcyclists are bonkers don't they so <laughs> well look at your career is you you are quite bonkers i mean you oh, are thank you charlie that's fast <laughs> <laughs> and, and i mean right from the beginning you were fast weren't you in in your career yeah i mean as it stands right now i won my first ever race and i won to date, my last ever race as well, which is which is quite a cool, quite a cool thing, and both at the same track, Brands Hatch Indy Circuit, um, and and yeah, I think one of the things that that was always good for me was the fact that it didn't matter. You know, everybody thinks that as a racer, you you spend like, you know, the whole year riding your bike, but the harsh reality is, you know, you maybe get like three or four days of testing before the start of the season, and you turn up and you do twelve rounds a year. So when you turn up, you know, you, you're kind of, everybody's sort of getting up to speed and feeling their way again. But I think I was relatively fortunate in that I had this ability to, to go out and from sort of lap one, be literally there or thereabouts, mm. do you know what I mean? And then it was just kind of small refinements from there on in, whereas other people took a lot longer yeah. to, to build into it. Because because those people, because because there's, the, there's always that feeling of, 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 the, of, the, of those sort of cold tyres, isn't there, on that, on that? on that first lap. I mean, you, you, there's the occasional, like, like you are, who's on it straight away, mm. where others take a, a beat. Yeah, I mean, traditionally, I've always been, um, I've always been the last person out of the pits, right? And and there's a reason for it. It's something that I noticed as as my career went on. I could, I could go out of the pit lane, you know, having not ridden for two or three weeks or however many weekends we'd had off, and literally ride out and, and, like I said, within the first lap be up to speed. But then there'll be so many riders on the grid who want to be towed around or who aren't quite sure where they're at yet. And, and you know, they might be, you know, halfway to the left or halfway to the right and, and, and in the middle of the track and not really doing what they're supposed to be doing. So I found it best to, to let everybody go, let them get to pretty much the end of their their sighting lap and then I'd go out because then that was me you know I'd, I'd do my bit with my tyres get everything up to speed and, and that was me I was ready to go then and yeah after a lap or two you're going to catch the guys that were at the back of that thing but at least you got a bit of clear track to say right okay that's it let's go rather than sort of dilly dallying around and you know after you sir or after you sir no, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not I don't think it's that. after you sir is it really <laughs> <laughs> get out of the way <laughs> <Get anywhere. laughs> yeah. is that partly yeah. an ability that you have to to remember the tracks and to be you know, comfortable in where you are immediately. I think it's a more about being in your own groove. Do you know what I mean? Like you, you, the best person at being you is you, right? You, you can't be, you can't be somebody else because the best person at being that other person is going to be that other person. So I like to, uh, I like to get into my own groove, do my own thing, and you know, be in my zone rather than messing about in somebody else's for five minutes because you know they're, they're halfway around the track or whatever. So yeah, I just found it much easier to 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 do me and be me and, and, and work in my own way and, and you know, carry on like that sort of thing. Were you really not bothered about anyone else on the track? Were you racing against yourself or were you conscious about the people you were racing against? I always say that as a, as a professional racer, basically Monday was my day off, right? And some people will argue that the day after Sunday, which is obviously the day you end up racing, you know, you should be back to work. But I always had Monday off. I always look forward to, to getting home and taking my children to school on Monday morning. Monday was my day to chill and reflect on whatever had happened, you know, the weekend before. But you know, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday are about preparing for Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And Friday, Saturday and Sunday, you know, Friday throughout free practice, um, one, two and three, Saturday free practice and, and Saturday qualifying, the work that you're doing there, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday's work have put your have put you physically and mentally in the shape you need to be in to, to perform on Friday and Saturday. And then the work you do on Friday and Saturday is the the, the reward you reap on, on, on Sunday, you know. So 
that was that was my way of looking at, at my career. You know, I knew if I'd worked hard Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, I'd be in good shape on Friday, and if I did my job properly on Friday and Saturday, I'd be in really good shape on Sunday afternoon. And ultimately, there's no prizes for anything other than Sunday afternoon. So you've got to work all the way through, and then you get the, the result at the yeah. end. And it's not about who else is there, who you're up against. It's just no, doing everything and, you can to the best of your ability. Yeah, and... because listen, right? If if I go out on on Saturday afternoon, and someone qualifies half a second a lap quicker than me because they they chewed the screen and shut their eyes and whatever else, it's not going to affect my time on Sunday. It's not going to affect my performance on a Sunday afternoon when I actually need to perform. And if, if you want to go that fast, crack on. I mean, I, I can go fast over one lap. I don't find that a problem. But I never, I think too many people spend too much time thinking about what everybody else is doing. And, and if you walk up and down pit, like you've been to, to PSB a million times and, you know, you'll listen to such, oh yeah, but he did it on a one or he did it on a zero or he had to chuck a tire in at the end to make that happen and whatever. I just think it doesn't matter what you need to, to do to just make get it happen. get on with the job at hand. To, yeah, make sure that Sunday afternoon, you know, you've got you've the package the underneath you that, that you're going to get on and ride. You control the you, you can't You can't change nothing. Yeah. Mm. So, so... You can yeah. control what you can control yeah. but it's, everything it's, else. It's, is. it's difficult to to do that, isn't it? To the what ifs and if only and could have. You don't seem to be the kind of person who sits there and says, oh God, I should have done that and I could have done that. You just got on with with the job in hand. I think there's a, there's a, been a, a couple of points in my career where if I could have done something slightly different, I think that the outcome might have been better now. Um, I also, it, it's really, really nice when someone introduces you as the most successful ever rider in BSB, right? Mm. It's, it's quite a cool accolade and oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite amazing. A, a, it's a number of championships in front of anybody, um, four more than anybody. It's, I don't know. I don't even know. I'll just put it out it's there. All right. <laughs> it's all right, <laughs> to be fair. You know. No, you can gloat when you've done that. You can't do it. You, know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you just stick to your radio <laughs> voice and let me talk. <laughs> <laughs> What was the award you didn't get? Yeah, what was that? You didn't win. No. So what I was going to say was, it doesn't matter what I've done. The harsh reality is for me as a as an individual, I failed because my dream is to be world champion. So if you said to me right now, I'll tell you what I'll do. Then just give me those six pots from BSB, and and I'll give you a world championship pot. I'd, I'd yeah, take it all yeah. day long. And, and you know, there's a, a massive part of me right now that, that still wants to be a world champion. I still I still believe I could be world champion given, given the right package, you know. Um, so, yes, it's nice to, to sit back, but that's like saying, well, yeah, I, I've got 50 quid in the bank. I wanted 100, but it doesn't matter. Do you know what I mean? Um, I'm happy with 50. I'm, I'm, I'm not happy, which is why I think I was as successful as I was in the in the last part of my, my BSB career so far because I just figured, right, okay, if I'm not going to get this World Superbike opportunity, I want to smash the shit out of this BSB <laughs> yeah, thing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I want it to be off. Yeah. The, I want nobody to ever be able to beat it. Yeah. And, and that's not because I so desperately wanted to be BSB champion again or again or again or again or again. It's because I wanted to be World Superbike champion, but I wasn't riding the World Superbike championship. Yeah, and it yeah. doesn't matter how many you win in BSB, yeah, sure. they don't add up to a World Superbike how, title. I, yeah. Timings wise, you you were BSB champion. You got a wild card for the World Superbikes at Brands. You won both those races, and that did that lead to the MotoGP opportunity? Yeah. Mm. yeah, so that led to MotoGP, and you know, I think that at the time, you know, we've had we've had a number of riders from the UK that have made it to to 500 Grand Prix or to or to MotoGP. And, you know, they've all gone there on like a one-year deal and, and you know, you don't go to, uh, ultimately, right, we're, we're all, okay, there's a couple of nuts missing in here apparently, but we're all, <laughs> we're all humans, right? We've got two arms and two legs and yeah, any, got, yeah. any, any rival on the grid has them same two arms and two legs, right? So you can't, you can't go into anything thinking, well, that guy's going to beat me because he's him or because he's him or whatever. You have to go there believing that, you know, you've got the same two arms, the same two legs. You know, he's got a throttle, you've got a throttle, you've got brakes, get on with it, do you know yeah. what I mean? And, and go and race them. Mm. But the the harsh reality is those guys grow up in Europe, you know, racing in those tracks, on those bikes and whatever. So for you to go there on a one-year deal and to, to try and take it to them is always going to be really, really difficult. But my Aprilia thing wasn't wasn't a one year deal. It was a three year deal, and it was the reason that I that I went to MotoGP because I didn't want to to go there, throw the thing at the scenery every five minutes, trying to make up for that lack of experience or whatever, and ultimately get sacked at the end of the year and, and get fired out. You know, I wanted that first year that they offered me. I wanted the second year on the 
on the new bike with the you know a little bit of pressure to deliver results and and the third year was basically you know depending on the second year if everything was cool we were going to go again so it there was a there was a structure do you know what I mean there was a plan yeah. um unfortunately very shortly after signing for Aprilia um Piaggio bought them out the Piaggio group bought, bought Aprilia and they decided that they didn't want to do most GP no more and said sorry but you know you're four months in or whatever um, you're, out. you're out but um at that point in time, one of the, one of the only regrets really I have is that I could have probably signed at the end of two thousand and four for a couple of factories in World Superbike, and at that point in time, you know the the, the World Superbike Championship had just gone to Pirelli's. You know the guys were yeah you know, there were some fast guys in there, but nobody that I look at and think to myself, oh my god, you know I shouldn't go there because such and such is there. Yeah. Um, I had that opportunity, but at the same time, I had the organisers, Dorna, or the owners, Dorna, saying to me, look, you you 100% deserve to be here. You've done a great job so far. We'll find you a bike for 2005. Please stay. Now, like I said, if, buts, and maybes mean nothing, but, you know, if I'd have gone to World Superbike back then, maybe I'd be sitting here as a six-time World Superbike champion, then I would be happy because yeah, I would yeah, have achieved that were, dream. But yeah. as it stands, I'm just... Grumpy and moody because I didn't. Join the club because you didn't club. get seven. <laughs> wow! Yeah. So this drive, you know, to be to be the best. Where does that come from? Where are the early days of biking? Because your route was was not conventional. Con- conventional. Yeah. Is, that, is that the word you're looking for? Well, it's just you know, <laughs> when you look at look at the you know the guys you were racing against who grew up. You know, the first thing they ever did was ride a motorbike, and they started racing from four years old. And mm. you know, there was pressure and development. They grew up in the scene. That wasn't your background at all. No, far from it. In fact, completely the opposite. Because yeah, this is this is no big deal. But I'm a I'm an adopted kid. I, I was born here in London, um, and at six weeks old, I moved down to Sittingbourne with my parents. And neither of them even had a, a, a car driving license, you know. So where this <laughs> um, where this sort of desire to be a motorbike racer come from, I, I honestly don't know because I don't remember. I, I just do not remember not wanting to be a motorbike racer. So, it, you know, my, my career's obviously used to laugh at me. He was like, what do you want to be when you leave school? I was going, oh, I'm going to be a motorbike racer. He's like, yeah, of course you are. Yeah, I'm going to be a, an astronaut. And I was like, oh, crack on, enjoy, you know. Maybe <laughs> you do your astronaut thing and I'll, and I'll do, you know, I'll do my motorbike racing thing. But I was I was dead serious, you know. And my mum still has like school books from, from primary school where, you know, you, you move up a class or whatever and you have to write down what you want to be when you're older and where you live and what your hobbies are and stuff like that. And, and from day dot, it's always been motorbike racer, but I've absolutely no idea, no idea whatsoever why. When did you first sit on a motorbike? You know, was the desire to be a racer before you'd even seen or, you know, touched one? Yeah. Or- yeah, yeah, yeah. Just- um, we, I remember actually going to Butlins at Bognor Regis. Um, we used to go there on our on our school holidays. You know, my mum and dad used to we used to jump on the train, and my auntie and uncle used to take their their trailer tent and chuck all of our bags in their in their car or trailer or whatever it was. And you know, we'd jump on the train and we'd meet them down on the south coast and we'd go to Bognor and and you know spend a couple of weeks at Butlins and and you know that was how I grew up. I absolutely loved it. But I remember at Butlins they had um, some little pooch magnums um, that you used to be able to ride around this this little oval. And quite often I'd just kind of disappear up onto, it was like a bit of a seawall thing or this bank thing. And I just sort of sit up there for hours and on end watching these guys go round and round and round on these bikes. But I was too young to go on them. But luckily for me, my my older cousin, Tim, he got quite friendly because he was old enough to go on them. He got quite friendly with the guys who were who were running them. And, and right on the last day, he said to them, look, you know, can you let my little cousin just have a go around? So, you know, I had a guy either side of me and, and sort of t- Tim running along in front of me. And uh, I got on that bike and, and rode it around the thing. And, oh, my God. Like, it, it's, <laughs> it, you know, if, if anything cemented it for me, it was that. I've got one now. I bought one and had one restored. Did you, you know, Daryl, I didn't yeah. he's done oh, one yeah. for me. So uh, I've got this little Pooch Magnum sat in my garage that I just walk out and, and look at every now and again. And it just makes me smile. That's amazing. But you, um, but had... At that time, had you you were already into BMX and yeah, yeah. And I then, used to I used to ride around on my BMX and and you know the the, the wheelie king. Was, I think yeah. at the time you were. When you, that <laughs> I, was I, your did, I did like a wheelie. Yeah. I did like a wheelie. <laughs> and and I used to uh, I always used to pretend that I was riding a motorbike. But the, the thing with this motorbike was it had about eight million gears because I just used to ride around <laughs> like doing gear change noises all the time and popping wheelies. And <laughs> you know the, the neighbours would be looking at me like that kid's not right. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some of my earliest memories are. Uh, getting on a push bike and just going, mm. just 
riding, not knowing where I was going. And I was probably, you know, four or five years old and my just disappearing. It felt like I was gone for hours and miles, but it was probably like 500 meters that's, up the that's road. That's the funny right? thing, isn't it? Yeah, but yeah. it's just that, well, you have that, that first that memory kind of, of little freedom. bit of freedom, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Before the, the freedom where you can well, just twist steps. that. And it just you be, the, freedom, the steps get bigger, doesn't you it? You had this tremendous accident which kind of changed, changed your life a little bit. Mm. Well, quite a lot. So, you, you know, I mean, we all, all of us have had big um, uh, uh, moments in our lives where, or life-changing moments in our, in our lives. How did that, you know, clearly you were in the peak of your career, you, 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 you know, you saw yourself going on further. How did all that um, feel in your head? Because, I mean, it, it's a, that's a lot to take in. The way I look at it, right, is that if, if you were introducing, uh, interviewing, sorry, uh, an electrician right now, there's a fairly good chance that electrician is going to have had an electric shock yeah. at some point, right? And if, if you're inter interviewing a chef, he's going to have cut his finger, isn't he? You know, it kind of goes with the territory. So if you're interviewing a motorcycle racer, they're going to have hurt themselves at some point. Is that categorically no way? Mm. The greatest rider in the, on the planet will, will not, not hurt themselves riding motorbikes, right? It's going to happen. Mm. But it's part of the job. And part of that job, you know, we're here doing this podcast now, right? If that microphone breaks, first thing you're going to do is, is run to the shop, get a new microphone, and then you're good to go again, right? And and it's the same for us. You know, our bodies are, are like a disposable item that you, you know, you break it and you're kind of rolling through the gravel trap and you think, oh, shit, oh, no, that's, that's a wrist. I've done a wrist. Oh, right, okay, what's the name of the doctor that does wrists? Um, right, okay, I'll get the insurance company to call him. I'll get myself booked in. I'll get fixed, plate it, and, and 10 days later, I'll be back on my bike. So life's always been like that, right? It's mm. been this... It's been this kind of, you, you put up with the pain and you put up with the, I always say the, the bad days make the good days better, right? So when you when you roll through the gravel and you really, really hurt something, that, that sucks at that point in time. But then when you come back and you win your first race back, it makes that win even more special. Yeah. Um, and that, that's how I've, I've always kind of lived my life. But the problem, the problem with the crash in 2018 is that it, it hurt me quite a lot more. Um, and it hurt things that you you can't hurt. Do you know mm. what I mean? And it's caused problems that at the moment aren't fixing. And that's a big deal because I've gone from feeling like a person with, you know, a, a 20 year old body, if you like, to, and, and, and not having any regard whatsoever for it. You know, it's, it's a tool that you use to <laughs> yeah, do a job. Yeah, abuse. Um, and, you know, you, you, cycle up the highest mountains and you you know you taste your your left lung on regular occasions because you want to be the fittest and the strongest and the most well prepared person that you can possibly be when you get to the racetrack to all of a sudden being told look you you, you don't understand like this killed this you should be dead you shouldn't be here you shouldn't be walking do you know what I mean this was this was big and i remember one of the days I think I'd been in um, I'd been in intensive care and I'd been in something even more intensive than intensive critical care or whatever, and you know I'm I'm always the, the the first person to want to get up and and to try to start to make progress. You know, like right, draw a line under it. Let's try and work from there now and see where we can get to. And I remember my surgeon coming in and I'd managed to get myself. Um, on the side of the bed and kind of stand up. And when he came in, he saw me standing up and went absolutely berserk at me. And he was like, get back in that. You know what I mean? Like, I won't tell you what he said, but he's like, do you not understand what you've done to yourself? Like, get in there, do not move. And and I found that, I found the pain of it obviously very, very difficult because it hurts, you know, motorbike. People think, it's amazing how often somebody will say to you because you ride my but oh you're used to hurting yourself. Yeah. Well you think it don't you think it, don't, you think it doesn't hurt me more than <laughs> oh, it doesn't hurt oh, you more than it hurts yeah. somebody it hurts. else. Yeah. Yeah. Just as much every yeah. day. It gets actually harder yeah. each time. Get motorcyclists are seen as the as the Careless. as the last of the of the of the great gladiators, really. Well I don't think they you do know. themselves any favours either because well, you see they're falling off you know, all the time, but, but you, <laughs> there's there's so many examples where you see someone get hurt at the weekend and you've probably done it yourself, you know, cracked a collarbone, broken a leg, you know, snapped an ankle, but it's, it's your right foot. So you can still shift a gear and you can still, you know, you see MotoGP riders on their crutches, mm. climbing onto bikes and then going out and racing. And I've helped doing racers yeah. well, there, there's, there's a reason why, the, med there's a reason why the, medical or the medical profession call them donor cycles. You know what I mean? Well, <laughs> it's that perception of, you know, and people see that on TV and think, oh, well, they, they can't be 
that badly hurt. It can't hurt them that much. If they can go out with a broken bone and still race a bike, it can't be... It's weird, so it almost can't be that hard. Yeah. Why are you happy to take that, to take the pain, to, to and then to put yourself back on a bike injured? Um, is it just, you know, is it a sheer bloody-minded focus or is it just you bloody love riding so much you that's all you want to do i think it's a it's a, a very very large part of both because you know at the end of the day if you're going to go and get on a motorbike or or you know race around a track and push yourself to the limit you've got to expect that at some point you're going to go over it and the re- harsh reality is that if you don't get back on your bike somebody else will yeah and then you've got a mortgage to pay you've got yeah. you know what i mean you've got bills to pay. Yeah. i have nappies to buy yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that's expensive um so yeah it's uh, it's important that you that you get yourself fixed and you get back as soon as possible but you know one thing that that really that really kind of um got me was last year ducati sent me a ducati street fighter v4 s thing right i said i want a bike i, w- I want to have a go on a bike i've not ridden a bike for like three and a half years or whatever it's so been. they said you order those they sent me ease what- you back in well i asked for it to be fair i said i didn't want a sports bike i wasn't interested in in having a sports bike um one of the things about about being a motorbike racer and, and about being me at BSB level especially is that the second I get on a bike, everybody's on pit wall with a, with a stopwatch and, and yeah, all yeah. of the photographers are there and, and the, the videos and whatever. And they're all watching and they're all waiting for a mistake and they're all wanting somebody else to beat you, you know. So you're under this immense pressure to deliver every time you get on a motorbike. But Ducati sent me that bike and I actually did about, I think I did about 200 miles on it overall, over a course of like three or four months or whatever. And what is this recently? Last year. It last was, year, to, okay. Uh, towards like last summer. Time. And this, is when, last this summer. is when you're you were feeling confident with your neck and, and yeah, and I, I listen. Putting that helmet on. Or and, did you do a Charlie and, Borman and just go out? I, I, I way before you were ready of, with the cage on. Yeah, well, cage no, still on yeah, leg. that, that yeah, would have yeah. been tricky. <laughs> <laughs> I can do many things, but even I couldn't have pulled that off. Um, Honestly, I know it sounds really, really petty, but it really made me realise just how much I love that that mental release of, of getting out and just having nowhere to go, no time to get there, mm. and and riding a motorbike. Mm. Honestly, it made me so happy. My wife went cracker. She was not happy. So did you ride, because a lot of um, ride could be a professional bikers won't ride on the roads. Mm. It's too dangerous, apparently. Mm. <laughs> it's probably fair. But have you always ridden all the way through your racing career? or were you... I wouldn't say I've ridden on the road a lot. Um, I mean, that's how you started. Yes. Wasn't it? So you kind of yeah. found, you know, found your craft of, of racing, well, ragging that, around that, streets for fast bikes. Is that right? Technically, no, because I, I kind of, um, I started because I worked at a motorbike shop at 16 and just used to take the bikes out and, and, and roar around. Didn't you borrow some bike and you had to sit back and then, and then the police turned up at the, at the garage? And uh, yeah, that might have happened as well. That was yeah. another customer's bike. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember um, on the other side of Sittingbourne, there used to be a place that we called Merston Track, and it was just some wasteland of Brickfield or whatever. But back in the day, you know, when I was 16 years old, riding a 50 in the winter, you know, it was obviously it was obviously really cold. So quite often in the evenings, what I'd do just because I wanted to be out on my bike was I'd ride down to Merston Track. Obviously, the, the DT50 had a headlight and I'd just go and do like loads and loads and loads of laps around around this track just to, just to kind of warm up and then ride to the jet wash and blast all the mud off and, and then that'd be me happy. But I remember the... At Merston, there used to be a place, well, I think it's still there, Free free Fishing Lakes. It's called the Free Lakes. And there was um, like an established traveler site there, right? And <laughs> you touched on it earlier on, but basically I've gone down to I've gone down to Merston and I'm there at sort of nine or 10 o'clock at night or whatever. And I've done a load of laps and, and you know, I'm, I'm quite warm and sweaty now. So I'm just sitting there with a 50 ticking over. And, you know, like when you've the headlight, you know, when you rev them, they kind of get a yeah. bit brighter, don't they? Yeah. Um, I'm sitting there, this thing's ticking over and I'm like, oh, that's better. I'm a bit warmer now, and I, and I thought, what's that over there? And I looked like through the through the trees and stuff, and I saw a person. I was like, <gasps> like that. and then I saw a couple of more, and I sort of revved the bike a little bit, and it lit these guys up, and there were all these travellers <laughs> coming over, <laughs> and, and I thought, they are not coming to say hello. <laughs> and I remember like like knocking the thing in gear and like shooting off and, and sort of avoiding all of these guys that were kind of now by now like running towards yeah. me to try and take the bike and um, going towards the, you know, the, the church that we spoke about and, and sort of, I remember that 
where the where the wall was broken, there were a few pebbles and stones and stuff on the floor, and I hit this thing and sort of jumped the wall into the church, kind of veered through all the, the gravestones or whatever, and then shot off and went away. And, I, and that was another time my heart was beating oh, fast. I don't want to tell you. Yeah. Oh, when, when you're running away from people, <laughs> I'd love to talk a little bit about about your your accident and 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 you know with with your wife. And in your book, you talk about. You know, there's a 40 minute period of time where, where she didn't really know what was going on. and Yeah, I mean, I honestly don't know too much about it. Only obviously what, what Petra's told me. And um, you're right. She kind of, she went up to the to the hospital on the premise that I'd cracked a rib. Mm-hmm. So she was furious because she had to drive all the way to Norwich <laughs> because I'd cracked a rib. She was like, has he gone soft or something? Do you know what I mean? She was talking um, about, I must, I must pack underpants this time because I keep forgetting yeah them. every time he goes to the hospital I never bring it. him new pants yeah, yeah. Um, does she ever get bored of going to the hospital my wife uh, has now just absolutely has no sympathy <laughs> well, she'll dump me there and then just leave me yeah, but. enjoy <laughs> no no she's uh, Petra's great you know she's she's always kind of had my back and, and we're we're like a team you know like mm. we kind of work hand in hand and yeah, she she got this call to say oh you know he's not too bad he's up and he's talking and he's got a cracked rib and she was like well why why are you why well, are you telling me to come to the hospital? But then my engineer, um, Giovanni Krupe, had gone to the hospital with me and uh, he'd been calling her and he was like, Petra, are you coming? Uh, and she was like, oh, he's cracked a rib. Like, he, he'll get over it. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's no big deal. Mm. <laughs> We've been through far worse. And he was like, no, 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 you, you, you should come. You know, you really, you really should come. So she went and uh, she said that she had this immediate like after the conversation with him she had this really bad feeling for some reason because it had taken a really long time to to get hold of anybody to, yes, to find out what happened so, yeah. yeah so anyway she she ended up arriving in um in Norwich hospital and she had our our two children with her she met Giovanni and and then the doctor came in and uh, he was like oh are you Mrs Byrne and she's like yeah yeah so she went off and, and spoke with the doctor and apparently the doctor sort of started working his way through the injuries and and yeah, started off with the with the with the smaller bits and pieces, but then sort of got more serious and 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 more serious. So, you know, it started off with this. She was like, "Oh, I've been told he's cracked his rib uh, or cracked a rib." He's like, "Oh yeah, oh he's cracked a rib. He's, he's cracked all of them." <laughs> like, <they're all> broken. <laughs> yeah. um, but that's the least and of your problems. Not breathing. Um, and... <laughs> yeah. So it, it kind of it kind of went on and on and on. Um, to the point where, you know, he'd explained about the spinal cord, he'd explained about the neck, the back, the chest, everything else that was broken, and then said to her, so I'm really sorry to say, but, you know, I have to say, you know, that these next 24 hours are, are absolutely critical. You know, mm. if he makes it through the night, then, you know, maybe we can we can start to do some work on him, but it's going to take at least three or four days before he's well enough to do any operations. And and that was when the, the reality hit her. I mean, obviously, I'm, yeah, you're I'm, I'm completely Comatous, away on, a, on, another, on another planet at that time. But, um, you know, for, for her, that was that was really difficult. And, you know, she she reminds me all too often when I when I go on one of my little kind of right, that's it, I wanna get back on a bike or I wanna do this or I wanna do that. She's like, You didn't have to sit there when they told me <laughs> yeah. you weren't gonna win. <laughs> and and, and Ooh, I get it. Wow. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I completely and get that's it. That's probably fear from her, isn't it? Rehab is a is a is a big thing, isn't it? I mean I I, I was sitting there watching you on on, on Eurosport and, and you were doing, you know, commentary for for I think was it Worlds or British uh, Worlds. And 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 um and you're sitting there with that with that very attractive cage. I have to say, it was it was you know very attractive. Don't knock it. Mobile uh, phone signal was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had about eight G. I think when I walked around with that thing. You can hear dogs talking. Yeah. So. <laughs> but, 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 but even though you were you were cracking on with it and 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 you know and getting in and talking about bikes and stuff like that. I mean that that must have been a real um. It must have been really hard for you. It was really difficult because one of the things that happened not long after I came out of hospital was, um, for the first time, was that I I decided, you know, my doctor had said to me, you know, give it give it a couple of months and then start to do some walks. Or, you know, you only got to walk from one room to another or whatever. And about three or four days after coming out, I was on my wife's running machine in the garage. And, and <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, that's no, not, not you. Run, not running, to be fair, like just, just walking, but... Um, well, they it, did say to be a little bit careful, didn't they? Yeah, because but it made me... still wasn't fused. Yeah, it made me really ill, like really, really ill. And uh, I got put back in hospital again and, <laughs> oh my God, like, I, I actually thought I was having a heart attack, but I ended up having pneumonia, I think, and... Um, it got it got so painful and because I was sort of stuck and, and the whole of my upper body couldn't move, I, I couldn't even like 
Yeah, Half my, my chest was broken anyway. All my ribs were broken and I had this like unbelievable pain inside of me. And I was like, oh my God, what have I done? But I couldn't even, I couldn't even like cradle myself like mm, a baby, yeah. like you'd like you'd try to. And um, sleeping, because you, you were that was it, just on your back. Yeah, right? that that was it. I mean, we went through so many different types of pillows. There, there's not oh, a pillow it's, it's that, awful, that exists that I can't yeah. tell you about. It's <laughs> <laughs> a new career. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe maybe I could do a podcast about pillows or something. <laughs> but, but the idea of not being able to to roll on your side and and oh it's just, I'll tell you a it's, funny it's story it's about awful. rolling on your side right in in hospital I think I would have been in I wasn't in critical care I must have gone into intensive care because then I was a little bit more with it but um I got so sick of being laid on my back and and I mean so sick of it like everything hurts you know what I mean you're, you're not you can't move you can't do anything and I remember when they first started doing, you'll remember these log rolls, right? So they, oh, yeah. they roll you onto oh, your side. Awful. And oh my God, like it, honestly, it felt like somebody had snapped my spine again and just kind of mm. twisted it and pulled it apart. This was horrible, right? But doing a couple of these log rolls made me realize that it was possible to get off my back. And this one night, right, I'm having, I'm having a really, really bad night. I'm, I'm <laughs> suffering like physically, I'm suffering mentally. And I'm like, right, I've got an idea. I'll do a log roll and I'll lay on my front for a bit. Because that that just give me a little bit of relief, and hopefully I'll nod off, right? And then I just gently, gently, gently started to rock backwards and forwards a little bit, and I pulled and pulled and pulled, and and got onto my side, and I was like, "Ah, oh, this is amazing! I'm off my back! I'm off my back! This is amazing!" And with that, I kind of tried to shuffle my legs and my bum across the bed a little bit so that I could kind of just roll over, and you know, like when you when you got your bed, you got the little buzzer thing in case anything goes wrong. Well, basically. From that point, I, I managed to, to roll myself onto my front. But the problem was when I got there, I was like face first, arms behind my back and, and practically suffocated myself because I couldn't <laughs> breathe and I couldn't move. And I'm fucking like this trying to find the, uh, the thing to buzz the nurses and they come running in and they were like, what are you doing? What are you doing? I was like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. oh my God, what a disaster. I laid on my back after that. I just, yeah. I was like, yeah, I'm cool, yeah, I'm, I'm cool yeah, with my yeah, back. Yeah, it's all right. Exactly. Yeah. So what was... Uh, at that point, what was your mindset like? What were your, you know, were your goals? Were you just, because of everything you'd been through in the past with injury and just that, you know, are you thinking, I need to get back on a bike, I'm going to lose my job, you know, as soon as I possibly can. That's 100% my sole focus is to get back racing. Was that what I think, pushed I think, you? Or? No, I think that I'll, I'll be 100% I'll be honest. That, that it, um, this wasn't a collarbone. Don't get me wrong, um, you know, getting home and getting on the running machine was me drawing a line under everything and getting going again. But, you know, when when the 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 outcome of the accident was described as graphically as the doctors described it to me, you know, I'm I'm no rocket science, but I'm not stupid. Do you know what I mean? And and I'm not saying that, that it made me think, right, that's it, I never want to race a bike again. Far from it. Complete in fact, completely the opposite. But I did think to myself, right, you can have to give yourself a little bit of time for this one. You know what I mean? yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> this might take more than a couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine as a racer, you know, that competitive streak of just, you know, every weekend you can for years and years and years, you're competing and you've just got to, you know, you come fall off, you get back on. You lose, you want to win. That drive. Did you process the the impact that that had had or were you just did you go back to type? I described something the other day um, as like Shane and Shaky being two different people. Um, you know, Shaky's maybe Shane's alter ego, if you like. And you know, I've I've only ever known what what Shaky would do for the last twenty odd years of my career. Um, and you know, Shaky is is still you know the, the predominant person in me, I guess. But Shane got left to to wonder about flipping out. You know, what what if you know, what if, or, you know, what if I've got to be in a wheelchair or what if I've got to do this or how am I going to do this? And I mean, I, I, I've not had, um, touch wood. I've not had full on cancer, but, um, I remember I got two, um, it's a piece of piss compared to breaking your back. Honestly. Yeah. Well, <laughs> do you know what, right? You say that, but it scared me more than anything else I've ever done. I remember going in and, and seeing a doctor because I'd started getting really bad acne at like 40 years old or something. And I was like, doctor, I never had it when I was 16. I don't want it now. Do you know what I mean? And this guy was like looking at me and he kind of went around my face and he was like, oh yeah, this is that. A cream will fix that. This is that. This is that. Oh, and, and, and here you've got, um, you've got a couple of, um, what are they called? Tumors. 
And I was like, like honestly, the, the first thing that went through my mind was, oh no, my kids. How am I going to tell them? Mm. What, what am I going to say? How am I going to say that dad's yeah. got, got two tumours in the side of his head? You know, that's, that's not cool. And I remember I had to race that weekend and, and it really, really got me like it frightened the life out of me so after the weekend I went to um, to see another doctor he looked at me he was like look these type are the, the the ones that you choose all day long it's absolutely no problem they're going to be like the size of a smarty I'll cut them both out and, and hopefully that'll be it they'll all be gone and that put my mind at ease a little bit and he took them out did the operation and what have you but that I think was the first time in in life that I've actually been frightened you know what I mean? Really frightened mm, because yeah. no, is, I look at my daughter and I look at my son and I look at my mm. wife and, and I feel like my job is to is to provide for them, you know. The 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 hard times that we suffer at home together make the, the the good times that we share, you know, when they're on the podium with me or when we're on a nice holiday or whatever. That's what it's all for. Do you know what I mean? It's not yeah. it's not for anything else. A motorcycle racer is inherently incredibly selfish, right? Everything um Everything about your life runs around you and your racing, and 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 it's a horrible thing to say, but it's how it has to be, to right? Do, yeah, sure. um, yeah. But having children, um, having children changes you for sure. But I think there was a time when people would say, "Ah, oh, he's lost it now. He's had kids. Do you know what I mean? He's gone softer or whatever." I think if anything, it makes you it makes you want to perform even more because now you're not just performing for you; you're performing yeah, for yeah, your yeah. children. Yeah. You know, I want I want my children to walk into school and say, "Oh, your dad won the race the weekend. That was great." Do you know what I mean? You said you get nervous. Yeah, I get nervous. Yeah, for sure. Um, but generally, that's a good thing. The more nervous I, I get, the better I'm going to If you don't perform. get nervous, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. Those people that don't get nervous about things like that, they're Cold, just dead they're hearts. fucking bonkers. You yeah. Know? yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that, you know, race weekend consists of, you know, f even though you're not because you're, you know, hydrating yourself properly, it consists of feeling like really dehydrated. It consists of, you know, headaches. It consists of like... <laughs> for want of a better word having the trots all the time do you know what I mean since 2018 the whole process is not so straightforward anymore anyway so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. things need planning very very carefully yeah, now yeah. <laughs> are you a warrior? no I don't think so I think that um, you know certain things certain things will get you won't they and, and certain things will make you mm contemplate what's going on and, and whatever else but I think all the time you're racing yeah you're, you're so kind of driven yeah. and so focused that you don't really have a lot of time to worry and, and you know ultimately I think a, a lot of a lot of anxiety or a lot of worry comes down to, to fear about providing you know on my part and you know all the time that there's some money coming in and, and you can pay the bills and you can feed your kids and you, know, you can take a holiday or, or whatever then, then life's not that bad I mean Do you, you think a lot of other riders feel that way or I mean Taylor McKenzie has, has just retired hasn't he from um, Super Sport and he was you know, he, he won his last race but he said the, the stress and the anxiety he was suffering was, was too overwhelming to, to continue and that was fears of you know, money coming in and getting the next gig and you know, the hustle that needs security. to happen and the security I, I, racing I think um, that there will have been a level of being Neil McKenzie's son as well. You know, he kind of expected to perform and, and maybe yeah. gave himself a bit of a harder time That's than he perhaps needed to. All right as well. And yeah, and, and yeah, Taz has just won the BSB title, so, you know, he's going to want to do well, but... And it just wasn't for him as well, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember with, with acting, you know, being dyslexic and stuff, I, I used to put myself through terrible... Um, you felt you should trauma. be an actor because of your father. Well, partly that, and but but and, and I kind of fell into it a little bit because we, you know he had four children and we were free, so he would just throw <laughs> us into his movies. But um, but but it, when I sort of started acting seriously, it, you know, I used to get terrible stress from learning lines, and, and because of my dyslexia, I just found it unbelievably hard, and and that's partly why I ended up stopping. Did you have a process that you followed though to 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 make it easier? Because I think that. Yeah. I think, you know, if you if you look at my GCSE results, you wouldn't say, oh my God, the kid's a genius. But at the same time, I feel like put me in, in a situation and I'll try and find the best way out of it, the, the best way I can, you yeah. know? It's not just riding a bike, is it? And, you know, setting the bike up, being able to understand preload, dampener, reload, you know, all the characteristic mm. tyre wear, all of these variables is that, that and go it's, into it's setting your... a bike up to getting it right you've got <laughs> to have a fairly strong intellect to be able to translate what is what you're feeling and communicate that to engineers for them to change something to make it work better yeah I think so but 
I'm a motorbike racer and then you you watch people on the TV or you watch acting, for mm. instance, and, and you think, oh, I could do that. And it's not until you actually try um, and, and you do it for the first time that you then finish a show or you you finish a, a, a bit of live TV and you think, oh, I wish I'd have said this or I should have said that or uh, how did I do that on, on such a thing? And, you know, people people don't understand that when you when you do live TV, there might be four or five people talking to you in your, in your ear, earpieces yeah. whilst two or three people are having a conversation with you and you're supposed to be answering their question. And, you know, it's, it's once you've you've experienced stuff like that that you you realise how good some people are at doing things. So the, the reason for saying mm. to you, did you have a process to help you do that was because you know, I, I finished filming an episode the other day um, and the first thing I thought when I come away from there was flipping out. Like, it really makes you appreciate how good people yeah. are at other things. Like, you, you think, oh, I could turn my hand to that. I could host this podcast. I could do that. But yeah. then you get to the end of like, it and you think, ah, oh, mm. I wish, I, I wish <laughs> I'd, you, I wish I'd have done this or yeah. I wish I'd have done that, you know? But where are you at the moment with, with your recovery? You were on a bike the other day, but, um, you know, where's, where's your mind at? What does the future look like? You know, they say you should never judge a, a book by its cover, right? You look at, you know, I, I sit in my garage, right? Mental health. We talk about mental health, right? The whole of lockdown. All I've done is walk into my garage and I have a, a stages bike, which is like a an exercise bike thing that's connected to Zwift, and I just sit in there and pedal. It's my it's my escape, right? It's my thing that I do, because up until that point last year, where I thought, do you know what? I I've, I I need to I need to draw a new line. I need to go back on a motorbike mm. because I knew something was missing. You know, obviously racing's missing, and that's the that's, that's me. Like yeah, Shaky yeah. Burn is a, is a is a yeah. motorbike racer, and nothing. Nothing like I, I fly helicopters and I love it. I absolutely love it. I, I love nothing more than going up in the helicopter and flying around and, and looking about and seeing all these you know cool places and not getting stuck in traffic jams and whatever else. It makes me really, really, really happy. Well, we could have sorted out the helipad for you if we'd known. You well, you should have said because yeah. then I wouldn't have to go all anxious about getting on the tube and <laughs> <laughs> life would have been so have much landed, easier. Landed in in Bassi and I'd have picked you up. <laughs> it costs about eight hundred quid to land there. I think I've not got that kind of money. Um, oh, yeah, what, what are you flying? A, 44? No, or, a Jet Ranger. Oh, Jet Ranger. Do you know what would make me really, really happy right now? If if you said to me, oh, there's a there's a, a couple of bikes here. Should we just go for a ride and have a coffee somewhere? No, I wouldn't even care less what the what the bikes were, to be fair, because I think that, yeah, motorcycling's a, a really a really unique thing. The, the sense of freedom, the sense of adventure. I, I, I couldn't imagine... With the with the greatest respect, going off and, and riding around the world because I get bored at the end of the first dual carriageway. Do you know what I mean? I, I even <laughs> want to start. You know, I have to I have to convince myself that I'm just going out for a little potter about and, and whatever else. But yeah, the open road is a is a funny thing and it's a it's a perfect place to just escape and have a think about life and put yeah. things into context. And or, or I really not enjoy think it at all. Either, yeah. which is another nice. I like the connection between you know where, where you can see the road rolling. Mm. Underneath your your wheels, you can you can you know a bit, bit of electric having the engine taken out. You, I want to ride an electric you, you bike. I've never ridden, I've not never driven or ridden anything on. electric just, yet. Well, 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 I'll, when the weather gets a little warmer, we'll organise and come and ride my live bike. It's mental, is it? Like, yeah. How is the connection with the bike then? Because you know, people people always used to ask, oh, you know, they look at your dash, like you maybe do a garage tour in the in the in the BSB garage or whatever, and some of the sponsors have come in and. They turn the dash on and they see the you know the, the the bar that goes up for the RPM and all of the information that we have to keep an eye on when we're racing mm. to make sure that everything's all right with the engine and stuff. And they'd be like, "How on earth do you get time to look down at that and make sure that you're changing gear at the right time and and whatever else? You know, how, how can that possibly happen? And it's it, it doesn't happen. You don't even look at it. You don't even know it's on there. Like <laughs> yeah, it's a yeah. it's, it's a connection. It's a yeah, it's, it's, it's a vibrate. feeling. But, and, and that's what's really interesting about riding a, a an, an electric bike is because that engine's taken away, which is something you're just used to. Since you yeah. first load of motorbike. Don't have to change yeah. gear. But then you don't have to, don't have to, to change engine. gear. Yeah. But then, but then, but what's really interesting is is that there's suddenly you can actually you can hear the road sound on the side of the road as well, and and so suddenly all this is 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 different. And then you know, like everything after after half an hour of riding, it it just becomes becomes just normal. Becomes yeah, and becomes normal again. But there's something very addictive about it. I'm not saying it's it's better or worse. I think it's I think it's just it's just different. I'm very curious about the electric thing, cars and bikes, um, and it's only because fuel's gone up to one pound fifty a litre. To be fair, but <laughs> oh, geez, um, think about electric now. <laughs> yeah, it's really it's really pushing this electric thing for me. Shaky, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you in. Thanks for joining us. Thank uh, you very it's much. Been fascinating. 
it's been a real honor having you along. Yeah, thank you, guys. You know, all of us, I can say, we're all massive fans of your career and 100%. and really looking forward to to what you're doing next. Thank you very yeah, much. All the best with it. Thanks very much for joining us on another episode of The Nod. We'll be back for the, another episode very shortly. I hope you've enjoyed listening to today's episode. Uh, join us next week. I've been Ben Bowers. This has been The Nod. Thank you, Charlie and Ant. Uh, we'll see you all soon. <laughs>